Good morning. Welcome to Gospel Life Church. The Lord Jesus, when his disciples asked him how to pray, declared that we are to pray, let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're singing a prayer to God that his ways would be known, that his will would be accomplished, that his glory would go through all the earth. It is a joy to celebrate that here together. You may be seated. Again, welcome to Gospel Life Church. It is a blessing and a privilege to gather on likely the coldest Sunday morning we will have. I see sweaters broken out. A few of you have blankets wrapped around you, jackets. I don't get to wear a coat very often because I sweat too much up here on a normal Florida Sunday. Uh, but it is a blessing to gather knowing that the Lord is faithful and it's not negative 20 like a few places in the country today. If you are, if you've got a bulletin on your way in, I hope that you will pull out that connection card that is there inside. That connection card is a way for us to know how to pray for you. I hope you'll take a moment at some point, either now or later in the course of our service, to jot down how we can be praying for you, whether it be praises and joys that you want to share or needs and burdens that you have. Let us know how we can be praying. We delight to pray, and we delight to know how to pray for you. So let me encourage you, make use of that connection card. You can drop it in the basket at the end of our service, or you can give it to me directly at the end of our service. We want to know how we can pray for you, so make use of that and uh, give us that privilege. Today is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. It's marked on this date because it is the anniversary of the now infamous Roe v. Wade decision. And by God's grace, the Roe v. Wade decision was overturned in the Dobbs decision. Today is a day, though, that we still recognize something that we ought to be treasuring every day. And that is the dignity, worth, and value of every human life. The Bible, from beginning to end, upholds this reality that every human being is created in the image of God, made in the likeness of our Creator, and by virtue of that, worthy of dignity, value, to be treasured, respected, and protected. As a Christian people, we need to stand for life. From conception till natural death, we must speak and advocate and intercede for those whose voices are not heard. For many, we presume that after the Roe v. Wade decision was overturned by the Dobbs case just a couple years ago, that this issue would be largely over and we could just live in the celebration. But tragically, that is far from the reality we see today. Our while some places abortion is virtually illegal, in other places they have sought to expand abortion rights and access to horrific levels. 
our state has recently passed both a 15-week and a six-week uh, ban on abortion while it awaits to be heard by the Florida Supreme Court. But meanwhile, there's been a massive push in our state to place this measure, this question of shall abortion be legal in the state of Florida on the November ballot, and it will be there. You will see it. Brothers and sisters, the Bible is clear on the matter of life. But the question of the legality of abortion in our culture is far from settled. So we as a church need to boldly declare God's truth in this matter. We have declared we love life. In fact, coming up this April, we're going to be having another Love Life Adoption Week where we will uh, share it on a Sunday for the entirety of the service and we will walk together that following Saturday after having prayed through the week in this matter of life. We need to love life, which means we love people. All people, no matter their size, no matter their level of development, no matter their location, no matter their ability, we need to pray that God would intervene, that he would change the hearts and minds of people to understand his truth, that life would be treasured and protected here, that his kingdom would come here and now in this matter. We need to be willing to speak and to dialogue with our family members, our neighbors, our co-workers, proclaiming the goodness of God's design and the dignity and value of every human being. As our service begins, let us begin by praying and asking the Lord to work in this. That not only would abortion be illegal, but it would be unthinkable. Because people recognize the value of every human life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God of life. Thank you that you have made us in your image. And because of that, there is a necessary value and significance in each of our lives. Indeed, every human being. God, I pray that we would boldly and rightly stand for life, that we would love life out loud. God, I pray that you would give us the grace to speak into our culture, into our, the spheres of influence that we have, that we would proclaim your goodness in this. That we would speak for those who cannot speak. Father, I pray for those who have been scarred by this tragedy. Father, I pray that you would comfort their hearts, that they would know the forgiveness and love of Jesus that's greater than all our sin. Lord, that we would be a people who love life and care well for life. God, be glorified as we live as your people. Would you answer in might for your glory here in this place? Be magnified as we worship. In Jesus' name, amen. We begin each of our, each of our Sundays with one of the Psalms. And we're up to Psalm 124. It's a song of David, a song of ascent, which is part of the collection of psalms where they would sing them as they go up the mountainside to worship there in Jerusalem. Hear the word of the Lord. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when the people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Where is your help today? 
Where is your joy? Where is your confidence? Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Would you join us as we sing praise to our great God? So The Apostle Paul's ministry was marked by hardship, struggle, and pain. But hear how he describes it in light of the hope of eternity. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. 
For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Let's continue to worship. and my Fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel, and sinners plunged beneath that blood, lose all their guilty Beneath that 
Join me in prayer. Father, we long for that day when the old will be taken off forever and the new will come. Father, we long for that day when the weakness of our voices to proclaim your glory will be joined with all the redeemed from every tribe and tongue and language, from every people and era gathered around your throne 
singing together your glorious power to save. Father, thank you that we can know your salvation here and now. Thank you that we can know you because you have spoken to us by your word. Thank you that you have not saved us and left us alone. But you have given us yourself. You have sent your Holy Spirit to dwell within us. And you have made us to be a church. A people called by your name, united together to live together, to walk together, to encourage one another. Father, would you continue your work of encouraging our hearts today? Holy Spirit, would you enliven your book to us that it would live and that we would be changed by it? Father, would you speak louder than I can speak? Holy Spirit, would you change hearts and minds that we would all be more conformed to the image of Jesus because of the time spent here together in your word? So, Lord, be magnified as we continue in worship through the preaching of your word. We ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus for his glory and our joy. Amen. You may be seated. Our children now, ages 5, 6, 7, and 8, are headed to Children's Church. And they're going to have the privilege to hear the stories of the scripture, to learn the stories of the Bible there on their level while we have the opportunity to study the scripture together uh, here on our level. Uh, let me encourage you, if you have a Bible, open it up to Luke chapter 7. We'll be about in the middle of Luke chapter 7 today. If you look at the history of the world and the history of publication, books that have been written and published around the world, the number one bestseller across all history across the world is the Bible. That shouldn't surprise us. That's an amazing thing. Ever since they started what we know today as the printing press, the Bible was chief among them to be printed and distributed widely across every language possible. In fact, we're still trying to translate it in some of the, the smaller dialects and languages of, of different people groups. But second among them is a work written by a man named John Bunyan entitled Pilgrim's Progress. It's a very well-known piece. It's it translated into numerous languages at this point. Uh, it, it is written as an allegory. It's a story about a Christian and his journey to the celestial city. It's talking about our lives. It's an allegory. It play, plays out the picture of our lives in following Christ and seeking that one day in heaven with our King. This allegory goes through many different stages, and if you have taken time to read it, I, I hope that you will read it again. If you haven't read it yet, pick up a copy. You can get one in modern English. It's a little easier to understand, uh, but it's, a, it's tremendous. It, it resonates with so many elements of our lives. At one juncture, Christian, who is the main character, is walking together with another believer named Hopeful. And they're walking along the riverside and the, the path becomes rough and difficult. And they look across and they see that there, there's a path through the meadow that was easy and, follow, and followed it with, with ease. But very soon they realized they had lost their way. It was dark so they tried to make their way back. It was a massive storm at night and so they ended up falling asleep in a little sheltered area there. And they awoke the next morning to the giant despair. It was his kingdom where they had wandered. And he captured them and drugged them to Doubting Castle, where they sat and chained in a nasty, dreary dungeon for four days, locked away. No food, no drink, nothing but the darkness of the dungeon in absolute control of the giant despair, and his wife, who is less than encouraging in the story. They sit there and bemoan of life. They question everything they thought. They, they wonder, can, can, can we ever get out? Will we ever be free? 
And after long time languishing and many beatings by the giant despair, late one night after they've been promised execution the next day, they realize there's a way out. There's a way out of the dungeon of Doubting Castle. There's hope to be free. We're continuing Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, we've been working through this as we've journeyed through the gospel of Luke, jumping back in here at the beginning of the year in chapter 7. Chapter 7, Luke is trying to show you who is this Jesus. Who is this Jesus? What's he doing? Why, why does he matter so much? What makes him unique? We're in the middle of chapter 7. We'll be looking at verses 18 through 35 today. It's a longer section, but it's all one episode in the life of Jesus. It's woven together necessarily as a story. And what we're going to see is in this, in this one episode, there are three separate scenes. Each scene has a question that highlights a doubt. And then the response and reality of Jesus and an invitation by him to us. So if you have a copy, I encourage you to follow along with me as I read aloud. We're going to read the whole of the passage and then walk through it slowly together. If you don't have a copy of the word in front of you, let me encourage you to follow along on the screen beside me. Hear the word of the Lord. Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 35. The disciples of John, that's John the Baptist, reported all these things to him. That's Jesus. I'm sorry, reported all these things to him, to John. And John, calling two of his disciples sent to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men who had come to him, and when the men had come to him, that's Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the... Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in the king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace. And calling to one another, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you said, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her children. This is the word of the Lord. The main point, I believe, Luke wants us to see in this passage. Look to Jesus in your doubts. 
Look to Jesus in your doubts. As I mentioned, there are three scenes. And in each scene, you've got a question that highlights a doubt. You've got the reality of Jesus in an invitation. So we'll walk through these together. Scene number one is there with the disciples of John coming and asking Jesus a question. Look quickly with me at verses 18 through 23 again. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the two men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. Deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor are given, are, have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. John the Baptist features prominently at the beginning of each gospel story we have. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of them set John the Baptist there in the wilderness, baptizing at the river Jordan, calling people to repent. He is the messenger of God, the prophet of God. He is there. But very quickly, after he himself identifies Jesus as the lamb who's come to take away the sins of the world, he fades from the scene. He himself says, he must increase, pointing at Jesus, but I must decrease. And he decreases rather fast. In fact, at this point in the story, John is languishing in prison. He's been imprisoned by King Herod because he called out the sin of Herod publicly. And that shouldn't surprise us because John called out everybody's sin. Why would the king be anything different? He called it out publicly. Herod didn't take kindly to it, so he threw him in prison, even though Herod was terrified of John. He's sitting there in prison. But you would think... This is the John who leapt in his mother's womb when, when pregnant Mary showed up. He's the one who first recognized Jesus. They're cousins. They grew up kind of together. If anybody wouldn't be doubting, it would be John. But remember, John is sitting in prison. John is the one who in his message proclaimed, Behold, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. He's coming. His winnowing fork is in his hand. Fire. Judgment. And there is John. There's been no chopping. There's been no winnowing. Where's the fire? Where's the judgment? Why are these corrupt rulers still in charge? Why am I still rotting in this prison? So he sends two of his disciples. I'm sure John was getting regular updates from his followers about what was going on in the life and ministry of Jesus. And John is, is a little bit perplexed. He, he's stuck in his own doubting castle at that point in time. And, and he's saying... Are you really the one, Jesus? Because I was given this message to proclaim, and, I, and I'm not seeing the wrath. I'm not seeing the judgment. Why are the Romans still here? So he sends his disciples. Do you notice how it plays out? The disciples come to Jesus and say, I, John, John sent us to ask if, if you're the one. It's almost as though Jesus says, okay. And then he goes on for another hour or so, healing people, giving sight to the blind, casting out demons, healing diseases. He, he, he just kind of lets them sit there and watch for a little while. And he turns back and says, oh, you, you guys had a question? R -r Remind me of that question again? You can imagine their jaws probably hanging wide open at that point in time. I, I, it, he had a question for you. See the mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus? The first thing we need to recognize is the absolute mercy and grace of Jesus for you and your doubts. They come with doubts from John. And Jesus answers in grace. 
and says, come look at this. Come take a look at what's going on here. So often we can be tempted to self-condemnation because we have a question or a doubt. But Jesus is full of mercy. In your doubts, come to Jesus and you will find mercy and grace. Jesus finally answers in verse 22. Look at it again. He answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, leopards are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. This is a crescendo of mighty works of God. And all of it falls in line with what Isaiah, from a variety of passages in Isaiah, Isaiah foretold the Messiah would do. Every one of them, down the line, Isaiah said, the Messiah is going to do this, and the Messiah is going to do this. And you see it crescendoing with the grand exclamation point of the poor have good news preached to them. And he graciously concludes his answer. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. His answer is not, now tell John to get with it. Tell John to come on. Get on board. Rather, it's you will be blessed if you are not offended by me. The physical prison wasn't the worst place John was at this time. It was the doubting prison that he was captured in. The doubt before us is we often doubt because we want Jesus to make all the wrongs right. We see wrongs around us in our world. We see sin seeming to triumph, wicked people seeming to win. And, and we, we look at that and, and we're like, God, God, are you really there? Do you really care? Do you know what's going on down here? Do you really see me? In in moments of injustice and tragedy in our lives and things that we witness around us. God, what are you doing? John looked at the status of the world in his day, much like we can look at the status of the world in our own day. And we we can hold out our hands and there's, there's little hope for peace or healing here. We see a world divided, hatred and envy on every side. We see wickedness seeming to triumph, war and violence stream across every headline. Even this past week, the police responded to a domestic incident on my own street. Where is God? Why does evil seem to run unrestrained? It's largely what philosophers have called over the centuries the problem of evil. And it's the source of so many doubts. Is God really good when my loved one passes away suddenly? Is God really good when my sickness won't go away? Is God really good in this tragedy in my life? Where is God? Why did he allow it to happen? Is he powerless to stop it? And yet Jesus, I love Jesus, because he responds not just with a word, but an open invitation. Come look, come see, see who he is, see what he's doing. He hears the question, spends another hour or so working miracles before he turns and says, here you go, guys. This is what's taking place. You see, the reality is that Jesus is perfectly fulfilling God's eternal plan. Everything that Jesus highlighted as an answer to these questioners was what was promised for him. That the blind would receive their sight, that the lame would walk, that the dead would be raised up, that good news would be proclaimed to the poor. Every element was promised by the prophets of old that Jesus would fulfill it. Jesus answers John's messengers citing the messianic hope. 
John wanted fire to rain down from heaven. And Jesus came preaching good news to those who desperately needed rescue. We so often, we want to see fire too. Where's the axe? Yet Jesus has come to seek and to save the lost. He has come to proclaim hope and forgiveness, and salvation. Jesus is the promised one, and He is perfectly fulfilling all that was foretold of Him in God's perfect time and in God's perfect way. Friends, we are not looking for another. He is the one who is to come. The writer of Hebrews opens his letter with these words. Long ago, At many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is the final revelation of God to us. Jesus is the final word from God telling us who he is and all that he has done so that you might have hope and forgiveness. There is no other. Jesus is the only way for you to be reconciled with God. I can remember back at our mother church at New Life down in Davie, we were building the building that stands there on the property, and it was a long, drawn-out process, and I was impatient, and I was like, why, why can't we go start stacking blocks today? Why, why, can't, why is it taking so long? And every time that I would impatiently inquire about why it was dragging out, it was because some essential element of the plan was being worked out. If I had started stacking blocks when I wanted to, they would have fallen over. Because there was no foundation. There was no footer. If I had started hanging drywall when I was ready to start hanging drywall, then it would have been a very dark place to go. Because there was no electricity in the walls. God is working His plan on His timetable, in His way, and it is glorious. We don't get to see it all. We know that His plan is good and His plan is right. And when we see the tragedy around us, we're tempted to doubt God because we want the wrongs to be made right. Remember, Jesus is working everything perfectly according to the plan of God. So trust Him. Believe. Notice the invitation, verse 23. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Don't take offense at Jesus. Don't take offense because he's moving slower than you want him to move. Too many people think they are wiser than God and somehow God's plan is insufficient because don't you see my need? Don't be offended at Jesus. One day he will come with fire and judgment. And on that day he has promised to make all the wrongs right. He's come first with mercy and grace for sinners. Sinners like you and like me. Sinners who desperately need mercy, but not judgment. Don't be offended that Jesus is the only way. It's one of the most offensive realities in our culture for Christianity today. How dare we say that there is only one way to be made right with God? But in God's good and gracious plan, He made a way. We don't realize he did not have to make a way. God is perfectly righteous and just to condemn all sinners forever. But yet in his grace and mercy, he made a way. In his love, he opened a door that you could be forgiven. Don't be offended. And don't let your offense turn into doubt Rather, come and believe. The second scene. What did you expect? Verses 24 to 28. When John's messengers had gone, gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? 
A reed shaken by the wind? What, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? What did you, uh, uh, behold, uh, those who are dressed in splendid clothing live in luxury in the king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And more than a prophet. This is he of whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. John's impact was vast. Everybody knew about John. Most people had journeyed out to hear John at some point or another. Many had been baptized by him. Jesus asked the crowd, why did you go out to the river to hear John? Notice he asked him that three separate times. They're rhetorical questions. He's, he's helping them to understand their expectation. What did you expect? And the realities of what's going on. You see, they doubt because of their expectation. It, John's ministry, you got to realize, most of it was in the lower Jordan re region. If you've ever been there, it's arid. It's a desert. There's no shade. There's no reprieve from the heat of the sun. Very little time was spent in the northern Jordan re region where it's lush and fertile and there are trees and there's places to rest. Most of his time was spent in the desert. And yet crowds, masses of people were flocking to the, to the desert to go out and hear this preacher. So Jesus asked, why did you go out? Did you go out to hear a reed shaken by the wind? Did you go out to hear John give you popular opinion polls? To give you what's trending right now? Did you go out to hear John, John's opinion on, on what people are saying about what you ought to believe and how you ought to think? No. John wanted nothing to do with that. In fact, John's famous introduction to his sermon was, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee the wrath to come. John wanted nothing to do with popular opinion polls. So Jesus says, why then did you go out to see him? Did you go out to see one finely dressed? Anybody remember what John wore? It's pretty famous. Camel skin and a leather belt. That would probably start trends today. In his day and age, that was the suit of poverty. He was not finely dressed. Do you want to see where the latest fashion trends are? Go to the king's courts. Go to the mall. Go to uptown. Go, go, go find where the rich and famous are. Figure out what it is to live in luxury. You can find that elsewhere. You don't find that next to the Jordan River in the desert. John famously was not well-dressed, but preached with power. So Jesus says, why then did you traipse out to the desert? Why did you go here, John? What compelled you to go? You wanted to hear the prophet of God. You wanted to hear the prophet give you the word of God. That's why you went to the desert. And you heard from a prophet, not just a prophet, from the prophet. And Jesus makes a big deal about John here. He lauds John with great praise. John was not only a prophet, but he was a prophet who was prophesied about. Malachi foretold that John would come and point directly to the Messiah. Jesus exalts John even amid John's brief moment in Doubting Castle. He says here at the beginning of verse 28, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. John was the last of the Old Testament prophets, even though he shows up in the New Testament. But he's before the cross. He's the last of the Old Testament prophets. One prophet who was foretold that he, as a prophet, would come. He's the one who was able to point to Jesus and say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew Jesus. He foretold of him. But he died before the cross and the empty tomb. 
He was still in that Old Testament line of prophets, standing on his tiptoes, peering forward, saying, It's coming! Redemption's coming! Messiah is coming! Hope is on its way! The greatest of the Old Testament prophets. The people heard from God. They had heard from the greatest of the prophets. We see the tendency to doubt here because we doubt when we want Jesus to give us the treasures of this world. Jesus highlights that by a series of rhetorical questions. It, were you wanting to hear about how to dress nice and live in lap of luxury? Were you wanting to hear the popular opinions of the day and, and what you should be posting on your social media accounts? Jesus speaks to the natural desire in all of us for the fat life. We all want to be in it with the popularity culture. We want the richness of the world from fashion trends to fancy homes and cars to the coolest toys and the newest tech. We want to live comfortable lives with comfortable stuff. And when it doesn't happen, we doubt. Does Jesus really love me? I've tried to be faithful and obey. Why does the, the wild, sinful guy who lives down the street seem to have it all? I do all this for you, Jesus. What reward do I get? A pay cut? Strained relationships? Everyone around me is moving forward and I am stuck. Yet Jesus points us to the fact that what we need most is God and His Word. What we need most in this life is not the treasures of this life. We need God and His Word. The reality is that Jesus is the Word of God. You need most to know God. That which will fill your soul with eternal delight is God Himself. You don't need to hear what's in style. You need to hear Jesus. You don't need to hear what popular opinion says about a matter. You need to hear what God says about a matter. The treasures of this life will all fade and rot, but the eternal treasure of Christ will never end. It's like when a parent goes outside to get her young son. Says, you're going to have to stop picking rocks out of the mud puddle. And of course, the young son, delighting in the mud puddle, is very upset. I love my rocks in my mud puddle. Don't take them away from me. I don't want to stop playing. But what the young son doesn't realize is they're on the way to the beach to build sandcastles and, play, and find seashells and shark's teeth. We tend to doubt because Jesus doesn't give us the treasures of this life. Yet come, taste, and see the goodness of Jesus. Hear Jesus' invitation in verse 28. The end of verse 20 28. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. The greatest man ever born was John. But the least in the kingdom is greater than he. What Jesus is saying here is that John is still seeing, looking forward. John never knew the cross. He never knew the empty tomb. He died be before the promised redemption was complete. Yet the brand new Christian who trusts in the cross and the empty tomb, just turning to faith in Jesus, the full forgiveness of sins, the assurance of eternal life, that is greater than all that John had. When you give your doubts to Jesus and trust Him to be your treasure, there is true and lasting joy. On this side of the cross, we have a far greater understanding and unshakable hope because Jesus has died and risen again. Come and believe in Jesus. Do not doubt his love.
because the treasures of this world are not given to you. Come find your treasure in the one who has conquered death and offers you eternal life. Scene number three. What are we like? Look at verse 29 through verse 35. When all the people heard this, the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Jesus speaking says this, To what then shall I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They're like children sitting in a marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came, has come, eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her children. The scene continues as the, the people are are. are, are pondering what Jesus is saying, responding to it in many ways. And, and you see Luke recapping, give us that parenthetical statement, verse 29 30, where he gives us the reaction of the crowd, the common people, including the tax collectors, who would have been the, you know, don't stand near them, they're, they're too dirty and unclean. It, they all, upon hearing Jesus, declared God to be just. It's an interesting phrase. In, in other words, they, they agreed that God is right. He's right about me. He's right about the truth. He's right about my need for redemption. They agreed that God is right. And Luke is quick to tell us that we knew that they agreed because they had gone ahead and been baptized by John. But on the other side, you see the Pharisees and the lawyers, the religious elites, they rejected God's purpose and God's work and God's message just as they had rejected John. And Jesus then poses the comparative to the crowd. What are you like? He used an illustration that would have been common in that day, seeing children playing in the center square of the town, and, and they would have had their little flute type instruments the literal translation is we piped for you that's the literal translation they played the flute or a lute perhaps they they played an instrument a bunch of children playing together they wanted to, to play like it was a wedding feast and have everybody up and dancing so they happy merry songs but yet you didn't dance others wanted it to look like a funeral so they sang a sad somber song in a minor key and they scold each other for not playing along rightly according to what they wanted. And then Jesus ties it together because he says this in verse 33 and 34. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine. And you say he is a demon. You reject him because he's too austere and serious. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. You say, look at him, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of sinners. And they, they turn to look at Jesus and say, you're, you're too silly. You're too relaxed. You're too happy. John was an ascetic, a severe ascetic. They rejected him. You need more joy, John. And Jesus says, I'm here eating and celebrating. You're calling me a partier. Jesus is essentially saying you can't have it both ways. Wisdom is justified by our children. We doubt when we want Jesus to fit our preferences. We doubt when we want Jesus to fit into our preconceived notions for who we think he ought to be. The religious leaders of that day had a certain expectation for who the Messiah was to be and what it meant to be a religious rabbi and a teacher. And Jesus did not dance to their tune. So they rejected. The religious people of the day, they wanted Jesus to merely affirm the things they did. They did. Jesus, come watch how I go to prayer. Come watch as I put on my fast. Come watch as I tithe. Come watch as I keep myself separated from all those unclean masses. We too 
are tempted to want Jesus to be remade in our own image. We think Jesus should love the things that we love and hate the things that we hate. Jesus, aren't you proud of how I stay away from sinners and dutifully go about my week and show up every Sunday dressed for church? Yet when we see Jesus working in a way that doesn't fit our boxes, Jesus, are you really there? We doubt because we can't fathom that Jesus would operate outside of our own likes and dislikes. That can't be godly. We can't allow them in church. We doubt because we struggle with submitting to Jesus as Lord. It's far easier to turn and question how Jesus is coming along in step with our tune than it is to surrender our tune and follow him. It's easier to doubt his goodness and his love or his wisdom when he is singing a different song from us than it is to relinquish our own melody line and join his eternal chorus. The reality is this. Jesus' wrath and judgment is far deeper than you and I can fathom. And his grace and mercy is far higher than we will ever fully grasp. He does not fit our preconceived notions. Praise God, he does not fit in our little boxes. When the religious leaders went out to hear from John an encouraging word, they heard God's judgment and wrath. When they went to Jesus to hear a message on morality and the importance of religion, they heard God's mercy and salvation for sinners. John was too austere and heavy. Jesus was too joyful and light. When you try to fit God into your preferences and your preconceived boxes, he will blow your boxes apart. And that's good for you and for me. For Jesus' wrath against sin is far deeper. The one true and living God the maker of heaven and earth, made you and made me to live rightly under his rule in his world. Yet every one of us have sinned grievously against God. We've sinned not only by nature because we are all sinners. We sin by choice. Willingly rebelling against God. Every one of us deserves the just wrath of our sins. Every sin deserves God's righteous anger and judgment in hell. You say, Pastor Mark, that sounds really severe. It's not about the gravity of the sin. It's about the gravity of the offense against to whom we have sinned. God is perfect and holy. No sin can stand in his sight. It is our sins against God that make it so grievous. Every sin is an act of treason against his throne. So his wrath against your sin and against my sin is greater than we can fully fathom. Yet also, his great grace is far higher than you can conceive. In the majesty of his great love, God the Father sent God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be born into this world. Jesus became like us, fully God and fully man, in one person. He lived the perfect life that you and I cannot. Yet he is the one who went to the cross. He died not for his own sin, he was sinless. He died for your sin, for my sin. He bore the eternal wrath of God in six hours on the cross. Why? Why would he hang there crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is because of the glories of his grace and mercy toward you and toward me. Jesus died so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could be clothed in his perfection. He rose again three days later, offering salvation full and free if you will turn from your sins and trust him. If you are not a Christian today, 
or if you don't know for certain, turn from trusting yourself. Turn from your sins. Repent of them. Literally means to turn around. Confess them before God and trust what Jesus did to save you. Trust in Jesus today and you will be saved. This is his invitation in verse 35. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. There's a link between verse 35 and verse 29. Verse 29, he says, when the people, when all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just. In verse 35, yet wisdom is justified by her children. What you see is God is personified by wisdom in verse 35. And those who believe are those who agree with God. Agree that he is right. Agree that he is good. Those who repent and believe. Who turn from their sins and trust in the message of Jesus. What about you? Are you agreeing with God today? Are you declaring God is just? I am a sinner and I need saving. Are you still hoping that Jesus will dance to your tune? Are you still judging God based upon your preference and doubting Him because you don't like what you see? Once you have submitted yourself to Jesus as Lord and embraced His word, come and sing His song. See, Christian and hopeful lay in that dungeon, suffering greatly, thinking it would be their end until they turned in prayer and Christian remembered he had a key hidden deep within a key of promise and he knew the key of promise would open the gates the iron bars and they were set free they were finally free when they looked to Jesus and the promise of his word they were free from doubt Look to Jesus today in your doubts. We doubt because we want Jesus to make all the wrongs right. We doubt because Jesus doesn't give us the treasures of this life. We doubt because we want Jesus to fit into our preconceived ideas of what we think he ought to be. Yet the reality is this, that Jesus is perfectly accomplishing God's plan. He is the eternal word of God, which is your greatest treasure and delight. And both his wrath and his grace are far greater than you can imagine. If you are not a Christian, turn and trust in Jesus today. If you are a Christian, keep looking to Jesus, even in your doubts, and trust him. Submit to Him as Lord and agree that He is right. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the testimony of truth You have given us through the Gospel of Luke. Holy Spirit, would You move in us now? Would You help us in our doubts? For those in this room who are doubting right now, Lord, would You meet them there? And give them comfort and confidence. Lord, for those who will be walking through a season of doubt in the weeks to come, would you equip them that they would fix their gaze on you? Gracious God, work now in our lives for your glory and our joy. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. At this time, Daniel's going to come forward and uh, he's going to lead us in a final song. As he does that, uh, it's an opportunity for us to respond. You can respond right there where you're seated. I encourage you to respond uh, and take that moment. And as you have that time to pray, you can pray with somebody there next to you. I'll be here at the front. I'd love to pray with you. Take that time to respond. And after you've had that time to respond, Let me encourage you to stand and join us wherever we are in the song. Let's take some time and respond to the Lord now.
Gospel Life Church is a Christ-centered community of worship because Christ is the answer to all our doubts. You may be seated. It is a blessing and joy to worship together, to celebrate God's goodness together. I pray that it's been a blessing in your life, an encouragement to you, perhaps even a challenge to you. And if you, there are questions you have, things you want to dialogue with, we'd love to dial, dialogue with you here at the conclusion of our service in just a moment. Let me draw your attention to a couple opportunities of, available to you. First, our men are coming forward now to receive our morning tithes and offerings. If you got a chance to fill out the uh, connection card, drop that in the basket. Let us know that you're here, how we can be praying for you, how we can encourage you during this time. That is a great way to get those to us. Also, uh, if you uh, have given to us in the year 2023, we have a giving statement for you available this morning. You can see Alex Pardo for that. He has those available. Um, and uh, if you notice any discrepancy or that you've got any question or concern about that, let me know. We'll make sure that it's done right and squared away uh, there in time for you to file properly based upon what you need. Uh, a couple opportunities. We have our Church Matters class that's going to be taking place February 4th. This is an opportunity if you're newer among us and you want to understand why the church matters and why it should matter to you, uh, come join us for that. This is uh, one of the ways, one of the, the process we have for joining in membership here at Gospel Life. We would love to have you explore that with us. We would love that you would make this your home and join us as a member. So if you have not done that, if you're not a member, or if you are a member and you just want to remember some of these things, join us February 4th. Let us know by signing up on the welcome table uh, that you can be there. We want to make sure that we've got materials and supplies for everybody, and we will be planning on that February 4th in the evening. Also, coming up February 18th, we're going to be playing pickleball in the park down at Plantation Central Park. Uh, it's going to be taking place here in a couple weeks. Be looking forward to that. Join us for it. It's going to be a great time, a fun time that evening, Sunday, February 18th. Every week, we're praying for the nations. This week, we want to be praying for the Tindy in Russia, it's about 10,000 of them there in that region of southern Russia, but notice there are no Bible-believing Christians. They don't even have the whole of the Scripture in their native language. We need to pray for the Tindy in Russia that they would know the gospel, that they would have the hope of eternal life, that the good news of Jesus would be proclaimed to them. So let us pray to that end. Would you join us now as we pray and have a final word?
Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this day and the time that we get to spend in your word. Thank you for the encouragement of the gospel. Lord, would you work in us that we would look to Jesus in our doubts, that you would uphold us and strengthen us for your glory. Lord, I pray for the Tendi in Russia. God, would you raise up missionaries? Would you raise up a thriving church among them that they too would know the hope of Jesus? Would you help the Bible translators who are working diligently to get the Bible into their language? Lord, would you do this for your glory and the salvation of those people? Father, work in us now that we would live faithfully as yours. In Jesus' name, amen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. May the Lord bless you. Let's enjoy a time of coffee and conversation together. Thank mm-hmm. you.